why do you need direct bookings? So anybody that's in service accommodation at the minute will understand that direct bookings are the only real way to build a solid foundation for your business. Now, to say that you'll ever get 100% direct bookings, I don't necessarily think that's true. I think you'd struggle to get that. You know, there's things I'm going to show you in here are going to mainly stem from booking channels. But the OTA commissions can be quite steep. And if you want to play the game, you need to be increasing your OTA commissions, not competing around the 15% level. I think you need to be moving it towards the 18 to 20% level with booking.com. Now, you can, there is a quick fix on that, that you can actually hike your prices because the, the OTA visibility booster, for example, that doesn't factor in price. It's not a price-led system. It's a who's going to pay the most commission system. So your properties are going to get shown to more people. So naturally, they'll get more bookings. So you can actually tweak your prices up to cover the commission. But I, I make sure all of our properties as a minimum are set at 18%. And that's, you know, for me, is gets traction and seems to be a fair balance. But it's still a lot of money that you're giving away. So why do we need direct bookings? For, for starters, OTA commissions then you know, we're not going to pay them. So we're going to save ourselves 18% per booking. It's not, a found, it's not a solid foundation to sit on. As most people will have realized in um, March, April, May, especially with, if you were Airbnb only, they decide to turn your calendars off. So ultimately, they've shut your front doors for you. You, know, you didn't even have the choice. And for me, that was uncalled for you know at the end of the day the government didn't restrict travel for certain industries so you know i think it, it, it left a bad taste for a lot of people with airbnb but it did show that you shouldn't build your your foundations on someone else's um lawn as they say you'll you'll end up with more profit because what tends to happen is they're not online price matching you. So when you start speaking to companies, they're just, you're just thrashing deals out. So it's like, how much would it be for X number of weeks? Or, you know, how much would it be for, for X, Y, Z? What I try to do, because sometimes the, uh, quite often they'll have, they might, they might say, oh, we'll have four weeks. And I might get the guest analyst to say, well, see if you can just get them to Monday to Friday and we'll sell the weekend as well. Because they'll want, a lower rate on a weekend, but they might not actually be staying for the weekend. It might just be, you know, for ease, if anything. And if they can get a good deal over the weekend, they'll stay. Whereas if they can't get a good deal, they'll just send their guys home and then they come back on a Monday. So I quite like to try and just get Monday or Sunday nights to sort of Thursday and then try and rent out Friday, Saturday to uh, the tourists. Now that traffic might not be massive at the minute, but you know, we're not investing in service accommodation for the next couple of months. We're investing in it for the next few decades. There will be weekends away eventually. Stag and Hindus will be allowed to travel again. We will be allowed to go on holiday. So, you know, think about how you want to structure your business, not just for the next few months, but, you know, long term. So for me, I like to try and get direct bookings just for the week um, or just get, sorry, the, the contractors for the week and then I like to try and get the weekenders. Depend on your location, you might not get any contractor bookings, then obviously you're just looking for as long as possible. But in an ideal world, uh, wherever you live, wherever you're operating, you will find some sort of uh, contractor bookings. So you can get more profit out of them because they're not price matching you against anybody else. You're just having a conversation about what works for them, what works for you, and you come to a price. You're not held ransom to reviews. Now, back in the early days, you were like shit scared of getting a bad review because you were like, Oh, that's going to ruin a property and I'll not get any more bookings from that. And, and I'm a firm believer Pareto law that, you know, 80, 20. So I'm a firm believer 80% of your guests will be good and 20%, no matter what you do, will twist about something. So you can go above and beyond for people and there'll always be 20% that won't find it good enough. They're always going to win. They're always going to leave you a bad review. So, I hate ever being held ransom to a review. You know, if you don't give me this, I'll leave you a bad review. If you don't give me some compensation, I'll leave you a bad review. Getting direct bookings, there are no reviews to have. Obviously, they could go on Google, but, you know, most of the time you've done a good job to get the direct booking, so the property should deliver on the back end. And 
as you've got a portfolio, quite a few, as you say, you know, you've got a handful of units, you can actually move them around your portfolio. So if you get a, a booking in and, you know, you might then get an inquiry for the same property, but you've got a good relationship with the people that are staying, then you could say, you know, is there any chance you can move in this property this week or, you know, and you can move them around your property portfolio, which ultimately means you'll get more occupancy across your portfolio, which ultimately means more profit. So you've got a lot more flexibility when you get direct um, with mainly contractors we're talking about here, but there are other ways to get direct with holiday bookings as well, which I'm going to show you in a bit. So the, uh, let me just pull this up a bit so we can actually see it. Um, so where do you, where do you get direct bookings? Uh, where do you start? Now for me, it's your low hanging fruit. So previous guests that have stayed, is perfect place, you know, the perfect place to start is previous guests. Where you're staying, how, how long you're staying, where you're working, who else is working with you, um, who else is traveling with you, do you often come back to the city, uh, you know, how, how often do you visit, all those type of questions, you've got to be asking your previous guests and your current guests and your future guests. These are the type of questions you should be interrogating. Anybody that leaves an email address or a phone number with your service accommodation business, you should be trying to interrogate them for more business, whether it's from them or whether it's from uh, referrals. Uh, again, I'm going to come on to referrals later on, but your low hanging fruit is people that are already connected with your business. So, um, you know, just ask the right questions. Who else is working on site with you? And, and the, they might not give the information, so you've got to push it and you've got to prize the information out of them. But those are the three starting points. If you just went and dug into your previous database of guests that have stayed with you, uh, rang every single person on that list, I guarantee you'd get a direct booking tomorrow. There will be some way you get a direct booking. They'll either be direct or they'll refer you to somebody that's on site. Um, where should you be every Monday and Tuesday evening? So this one for me is, it's it's, it's the long, you play the medium long game with this one, but it, it does work. So basically most companies when they're traveling, they'll go to the furthest destination away on a Monday and Tuesday and they'll work their way back down towards home. So if it's um, Monday and Tuesday night, they'll be just banging themselves in a hotel and they could be coming back to that hotel every Monday, Tuesday night. Head out about 6.30 till about 8.30, drive around a few hotels, just take a picture of all the vans in the hotels and then the next morning, get on the phone to those companies and be like, hey, I was passing so-and-so hotel last night or I was having a drink in so-and-so hotel last night. I noticed that your vans are parked there. Are you in the area often? You know, what do you do, et cetera. And then you go into what you do, um, how you do it, you know, where you've got properties, how you can help them save money and how you can deliver a better experience than a hotel or a B&B. Right now, we have the best pitch that, we could probably ever need over a hotel is we are a much safer environment for your staff. Because, you know, I guarantee you there'll be companies that are starting to get hit with claims that they caught COVID when they were away working because they didn't look after them. They put them in a hotel and all that rubbish. So, you know, hotels and B&Bs every Monday and Tuesday evening, get out van stalking. If you want to take it one step further, every morning, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, where do you think they go for breakfast? So McDonald's car parks, fast food breakfast shops, vans on the side of the roads, you know, little pit stops or breakfast vans, Greg's in certain areas, you know, there will be vans parked outside those um, shops. I now still to this day, even though obviously I don't get involved in, in all of this, but my staff do. I just measured the KPIs on it. But I now, if I am in a petrol station filling up and I see a van that's out of area, I'll either write the number down, shoot a voice note, or take a picture and send it to the guest handlers and then they'll start ringing these people. You know, you've got to have your eyes and ears open at all times as you're moving around your city. And just anything that looks out of area, you know, an 0161 number, an 0203 number, whatever it might be. If it's not an area number or it doesn't look like it's local, investigate it ring the phone, ask the questions. You just never know what you might get out of it. We have earned tens of thousands of pounds from doing these exercises and filling our properties up every single week, you know, with new bookings or repeat bookings that originated from this type of activity. It just depends how far you want to push it. 
But also don't give up at the first hurdle because on a Monday and Tuesday, you might go out and you might not get nothing. You might not see any vans or all the vans might just be white vans with nothing on them. You could take it one step further and go into the hotel bar and start asking questions. But, you know, for the majority, you want to move quick and just get around. You could do a few weeks where you're not getting any results, but it just takes one booking, one booking for eight weeks, one booking for 12 weeks to make it all worthwhile for those, you know, one or two hours every Monday and Tuesday night that you spend. By the way, there'll be a Q&A at the end here, so I'm just going to kind of rattle through it all and then um, we can jump into questions. So every week, put time in your diary to visit construction sites. There's plenty of construction sites going on in every city. You need to find out where they are. Again, you know, drive them around or you could even ask, you know, just ask people uh, on Facebook or wherever it might be, what's going on in the city. You know, there's probably council websites you can jump on. But just out and about, always be aware and take note what's happening, what roadworks are going on, what buildings are getting built, what universities are getting extended, anything big and construction-y, roads, any sort of council type stuff, they will all be getting hired in help. So drive in and take note. Get out and ask questions, you know, speak to the people on site and you could take one step further and leave cards on the vans because... When you dig into your guests, especially the contractors, they, they want a couple of things, but mainly they want to be able to finish at work, drive back to the same place every week, get in the same shower that they used to work in, so they know what temperature to have it on, they know what channels work on the TV, and they can you know, sleep in a bed that they're comfortable with. They do not want to be going to different hotels or different units or you know, trekking different sides of the cities and fiddling with lockbox codes or having to go to a key nest and pick something up. When they find a place that they're happy with, they'll be telling their boss, they'll be telling their, that whoever books their accommodation for them, please book that place again. It's so easy to get to. The, the, this, the, the employer just wants the best for their staff. They just want to make sure that they, um, you know, can have a good time, that they're happy, that they're motivated and they're quite happy being away from home. They want a home away from home. So just make it as easy as possible. Leave cards on vans, tell them what you do, get out and ask questions, drive in and take notes. And, you know, over time, you start building relationships with these people. I'll just pull this down here. So universities, hospitals, and council managers. Again, universities, you've got a lot of people that come over to visit. You've got a lot of uh, family that come to visit. You know when the um, graduations are on, all that sort of stuff. Hospitals. All the time. We've got a couple of units near certain hospitals in the cities we operate in. We are always getting booked by nurses coming for one or two month stays. And they're working in that hospital as a relief nurse or a relief doctor. And they just need short-term accommodation. The hospitals are paying for this. So they're given a budget, but their budgets are quite healthy. And the hospitals pay for it. They stay for 30, 60, 90 days at a time. And they pay good money and they leave no mess. So get in with hospitals and again with councils as well. The managers in the council will tell you what's going on in the city, what accommodation needs they have. The best place to find people like this is on LinkedIn. So, you know, use LinkedIn in a way that like, I hate it on LinkedIn when I connect with someone and then I get some spammy shite email about how great their services are and they do not ask one question about me as a business. You know, it's like, I'm so great. I do this. We deliver this. We do this. They never once say, hey, how are you? What are you up to? How's your business going? You know, it's just so in your face. And for some reason, LinkedIn seems to be like that. Um, like, break the mold on it. With anything, you know, I talk about this all the time with, you know, the clients that I work with inside the program is we've got to build relationships. Don't go in like, a, you know, bull in a china shop. You'll get no results from it. Just like, the hundreds of people that send me that crappy little message every, every week do not even get a reply. You know, it's going to take someone to break the mold and actually get into me and want to understand me and want to build a relationship with me before I'm going to engage with them. And this is exactly the same with this strategy. You know, some of these strategies are quick fixes and some of them are sort of medium to long term and just playing the, the relationship game. So, you know, use LinkedIn, find these type of people on LinkedIn, connect with them, start having conversations with them. Don't just go throwing your services down their throat because you'll not get anywhere. You've got to build the relationship first. 
uh, insurance groups, exactly the same. So insurance groups are, you know, magic to work with because they have the budgets. And, you know, if somebody has a house fire, somebody has a massive flood, um, they, you know, need whatever massive excavation works or whatever it might be, then the insurance companies will pay to put them in short-term accommodation. Insurance companies factor this into their model so they know what short-term accommodation looks like in terms of a price, and they're willing to find it. There are loads of insurance groups uh, related people on LinkedIn. Again, don't send spammy emails, build relationships. Find out which ones you know, offer home insurance, and then you wanna be tapping into them and finding out where they tend to send people in your area when they do have uh, someone to move or do they recommend them through an estate agent? If so, you then want to go and link up with the estate agent. So, you know, get into, get into these type of people. You can even just pick the phone up, you know, go on Google, type whatever insurance company, household insurance, Newcastle, household insurance, wherever, you know, there'll be companies come up, start speaking to them. Some of them might just be brokers for other larger insurances but the brokers might be a bit more open to actually giving you the information of who the um, you know, accommodation person is within that, in the insurance group to arrange it, or who the dedicated estate agent is that that insurance group works with. So you wanna be just trying to you know, move your business forward by you know, making these, these phone calls and getting into different areas. And finally, there are loads of Facebook groups. We live in this property bubble and probably most of us see nothing but property all day, every day. But there are other groups out there, you know, there are other people on Facebook. So get out there and, you know, start having a look at, you know, there'll be clay insurance claims groups. There'll be, you know, various different groups of uh, insurance employees, you know, insurance sort of networks, you know, it's a big industry, the insurance game. So these people will be pooling in groups. You need to get into the groups and you need to start just asking the questions, building the relationships and opening the conversations. This is starting to annoy me, but moving this around. Um, referral campaigns. So you should, everyone should have a referral campaign in their business, you know, but don't accept, I'll pass them your details, because that's just a total fob off and you'll get absolutely nothing for it. So you need, first and foremost, you need a good referral campaign. So, you know, you can do either a set fee, just, you know, I'll give you a hundred quid per referral or whatever it might be. You could do vouchers, you know, I'll give you hundred pound M&S vouchers or 50 quid or whatever it might be. Or what I find works the best is a percentage of the booking and any future bookings as well. So especially with the contractors, when they're referring other people on site, they think, oh, well, I could get a little tick here every single week. So they get a percentage of the booking. Don't accept, I'll pass them your details because that, that just basically means like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. You know, no one's going to go out the way to do it. You need to be getting the details. So you, you need to be saying to them, listen, I've got this great referral campaign. This is how it works. I'll pay you a percentage of the booking and any future bookings. Uh, typical gross value is X, Y, and Z. So you're looking at this. All I need from you is who's working on site with you. What other companies are there working with you? Have you made any friends with any of them yet? Do you know where they're staying yet? You know, can I get Jimmy's number? If not, it's fine. Can I just have the company name and I'll do my own investigation? But I will cut you in on the deal. And as long as you cut them in on the deal, you bet your bottom dollar that that starts to snowball. So set up a good, strong referral campaign, but make sure that you don't just say, oh, by the way, I've got this campaign. Would you mind passing me any details? And you go, yeah, no worries. I'll pass them your details. That doesn't work. You've got to actively get the referral there and then. You need the name and the number after you've delivered your promise. Um, good businesses are driven by targets. I, I run my whole business on numbers and KPIs. Um, it's, you know, I did a training session with seven figure guys on Sunday, all about how to scale your business by looking at numbers. And you need to make sure you've got a direct booking target every single day or every single week. It's, this isn't a case of, oh, well, I might do some phone calls and get some bookings. Set yourself a target. So one property you should set yourself a direct target of £100 a week minimum for every property that you've got. And that's what you should be trying to drive through because 
by hitting your targets, you'll drive your business forward. You'll make more money. If you just do this as a off the cuff type of thing, because you know maybe your bookings are a bit light, or maybe COVID and Airbnbs decide to shut your business down, then you start panicking and doing it. Then you're only going to ever have a reactive result, which will get you a quick fix, but it's not going to be sustainable, and you will still have the highs and the lows of direct bookings. When you start getting in bed with these people, you know, especially the insurance companies, um, you know, especially the referral campaigns, the councils, all those type of people, you'll start to get a flood of business just passed down to you all the time. And, but you've got to have a target to make that happen because if you're not out actively doing it week by week, then you'll never achieve your target. If you've got no target to drive yourself forward for, you'll never achieve it and this will not grow. Uh, Google Maps. This is a good one. Um, I still find that it does make the phone ring. There's no doubt about it. I still think sometimes they tend to end up back at the booking channels, but uh, we do get direct bookings through this. Just literally title your property um, a keyword such as um, city center accommodation in Newcastle. Um, you know, apartment accommodation in Newcastle, you know, high rise, whatever. Just choose a keyword at the beginning and then accommodation in and then your city. The reason you do that is when most people go into Google and they go to search or something, they're going to type accommodation in Newcastle. You're just chucking a keyword in the front there so that when you've got all your listings, it's not all the same name. So it could be large, it could be huge, it could be uh, luxurious, it doesn't matter. It's just accommodation in the city that you're in or the village or the town is the key part of it because that's how people will search on Google. And then make sure when they find your Google advert that you're easy accessible, it links to your properties and you can then, you know, they can pick the phone up or they can email you and, and make it easy for them to, you know, a quick call to action of how they get in touch with you before they get bored, flick back off. They kind of find out, get in touch with you. They go back to the booking channel. So, um, but that's a, the, it's, it's, this is a start planning this now because it's quite difficult at times to get Google to actually list you and it can be a bit of a pain. They basically send a letter out to your post, to your address, the letters don't arrive. And, you know, so it can be a bit of a hassle, but the ones you can get set up, get them set up, you will get bookings from it. Facebook hunting. Anyone that knows me knows I love Facebook. It, is like the best tool that Mark Zuckerberg has ever created for businesses wanting to scale. If you know how to use Facebook, then you can effectively grow your business without spending any money. And in the, you know, sort of the, the beginning phase of any business, not having to spend money to market or buy leads or buy data. You know, I used to sell data when I was 19, 18, 19 for a company. You know, people used to pay tens of thousands of pounds for lists of names and numbers. Now you get it for free by just logging on to Facebook. So use the channel as it should be used. It's not a social media platform. You know, it, that's a different training altogether, but it's not a social media platform. In Facebook, there are Facebook travel groups. There's contractor groups. Um, there's service accommodation swaps to be had, especially in, you know, the bigger networks. You know, just posting on, uh, has anyone got property in this group? Or you can actively say, I'm quite happy to run service accommodation swaps. Contractors move through the country. So when you get a good relationship with a contractor, you know, I had one that stayed with us recently for, uh, they took two houses for, I think it was four months. And then they went on to Harrogate. I sorted the Harrogate gig out for them. You know, they're then going on to Liverpool. Then they're going back to Belfast. And then they're coming back here in March. I will look after all their accommodation for them because I know when they come back in March, they're going to book with me. So, you know, make sure that you've got the ability to be able to do service accommodation swaps with people. And also there's plenty of WhatsApp groups out there. You know, there's plenty of, you know, service accommodation in your city groups. If there's not, set one up. Set, set your own WhatsApp group up, you know, for service accommodation swaps in your city, whatever it might be, and just start promoting on Facebook in no time at all. You'll have your group full, 270-odd people, and it'll provide a good source of leads as long as you're quick and you're on the pulse. But Facebook travel groups, whilst they haven't been as popular right now, there's plenty of um, hen party groups, you know, stag party groups, luxury holidays, you know, lake district type holiday groups. There's always people in there saying, like, has anybody got a 
four bed house on this weekend or you know in the stag and hen groups you might get has anybody got a 10 bed house or a 14 bed house in certain cities or i'm looking for a hen do location you know you should be in there if it's not if you've got guest handlers working for you you should be you know not only targeting them for direct bookings but you should be targeting them to get in the groups and do some prospecting you know be hunting those bookings down be getting in there and be like we've got a 14 bed house in newcastle it's a great city it's perfect for a hen do Tell me more about your Hindu, what are you are looking for? So this is how you kind of leverage Facebook to make sure that you get the most for your property. Service accommodation is a business. It's not just get a property, stick it on Airbnb, cross your fingers and hope for the best. It is a business. You wouldn't buy a Subway franchise and not market your product. You know, put your posters in the window, get a nice location, you know, start marketing your product. You know, you just wouldn't do it. Service accommodation is exactly the same, yet we fail to market the business. We fail to prospect the business. Tell contractors where else you've got properties. So again, a bit like the story um, I've kind of shared there, but tell them where you've got properties because they might be going to different cities. If you operate in multiple cities, then they might be like, oh, well, yeah, you can sort me out in that city or in that city. Or as I've just mentioned before, tell them, that you can connect them in the UK and make, you can make commission from it. You know, the Harrogate book when I sorted out, the Liverpool, you know, I want a little drip on that. You know, my time is money and, you know, I want, I want paying for that. So that, but there, if you, if you jump into a group and say, I've got this booking, you know, 12 guys coming for three months, I guarantee you'll get a lot of people put their hand up and be willing to pay you commission to get that booking. You know, you're the one that holds the power. So, Tell them you can connect them anywhere in the UK and also tell them, you know, where your properties are in the UK as well. And that means that whenever they're traveling, they're going to think of you first. They're going to pick the phone up to you and at least give you a bite of the cherry to try and fix them up and obviously make some money because that's what we're all here for, right? Um, work with estate agents. So a lot of estate agents don't offer sub six month contracts to anybody, yet they'll have people that do inquire about short-term um, accommodation. So people, most people looking to rent a house don't realize you've got to have a six-month um, contract as a minimum. I mean, you don't, don't have to have, but, but that's the way most estate agents and landlords will work. So they will just naturally ring up an estate agent and be like, hi, I'm looking for a property. I've sold my house. Uh, I've had to do this recently. We sold our house in lockdown, didn't have an ongoing purchase arranged. I moved into a flat for three months. So you know, that's just what had to happen. So I managed to find somewhere, but most of the agents don't offer that. So people moving house and people relocating sub six months, you want to be finding out which estate agents don't do it. And maybe just asking the question, do you often get many inquiries for it? You know, this could be part of your relationship building as you're going around to, you know, try and get your rent to rent deals on or get your BRR deals on or whatever. It could just be part of the conversation with an estate agent. Do you ever get many inquiries sub six months? Yeah, we do. What do you do with them? Nothing. We kick them to the curb. Is there any chance I could put a process in your business and pay you a commission? You know, and we'll start working with these type of businesses. So you're just starting to unlock loads of different doors to make sure that you're omnipresent. Make sure everyone knows what you do. Football clubs. Now, this doesn't work for Premier League football clubs. You know, um, with the greatest respect, and I know some of us might have nice Airbnbs. I know fine well that if, I don't know, Ronaldo wanted to come and sign for Newcastle, he ain't going to stay in one of my Airbnbs. That's just a fact. All right. But lower league clubs, Division 2s, Division 3s, you know, conferences, these boys are not on fortunes. You know, they're playing football for very little money. The clubs will take them on on a trial around the transfer windows where they might need accommodation for two to three weeks. So, you know, they, they just need to be around the football club. If you've got accommodation near these sort of football clubs, you want to be finding out who in the football club arranges travel for um, people that are coming on trial or when the new signings are relocating. So when, when they do sign somebody, they come up. In the lower leagues, they can't afford to stay in hotels. They're not going to be staying in, you know, your, 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 your Ritz hotels until they find a house. They will need to find accommodation on a short-term basis until they find longer-term accommodation so this is a great way to get in um sunland's a good example of this because they're rubbish 
<laughs> so, uh, but no, uh, even Sunderland probably wouldn't match. But the um, your lower league football clubs, they would definitely have the right um, avatar of, of player that would be you know comfortable in in, a, in our location. So reach out to them, and again, another another opportunity for you. That. I've rattled through that as quick as I possibly can because I want to get on to questions. I know everyone was asking loads of questions before we started. So um, just pop in the chat just while I grab a quick bit of water. What your key takeaways were from that? Um, and then we'll come into Q&A in a second. People are already popping questions. Just write your key takeaways um, first, and then we'll come on to questions. I just want to kind of get a feel for uh, what stood out for people. Uh, obviously, Ryan's key takeaway was that Newcastle are a better team than Sunderland. Newcastle are rubbish, to be fair. Uh, Estate agents is a great idea. We actually had a referral from an estate agent we work with and didn't even think to set up a referral scheme. Right, well, at least you've got the relationship there. Now you can go back, you know, or learn from it. Uh, going to McDonald's for breakfast, fan stalking. Yep, as long as you stay out of McDonald's, that's the downside of that one. <laughs> McDonald's breakfast never good for anyone. Uh, great, learn a lot. Stations, football clubs, great idea. Uh, the whole process of learning curve, so many opportunities. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I come back to it time and time again with service accommodation, and it is a business. We've got to treat it like a business. Every day you open, you've got to be marked in your business. This is a form of, you, you either marketing or selling. So selling comes in the form of prospecting, and obviously marketing comes in the form of advertising. So how are you doing both parts of those for your business every single day? You know, Apple certainly don't open their business and they shut their marketing departments or their sales departments every day. They're the first things that will open in any business. Uh, getting out and about networking to all areas, hospitals, agencies, building those ships. Yeah. I mean, obviously at the minute, it's, it is a bit difficult to get out and network a bit, but there's plenty of stuff going on online now. So you can still, you know, you can still pick stuff up, but you know, you don't have to be, um, you know, going to hotel bars every night to find direct bookings. You know, you don't even need to get out of your cars. You can just do quick drive-bys through the car parks. Um, just mix up the hotels you go to or someone might think you're a bit weird <laughs> every week to see you come in on Monday at 6.30 and drive through. Um, so you also might want to tell your partner what you're doing because <laughs> if someone spots you coming out of a hotel car park, they might think twice. Um, right, cool. So let's... Um, Right, I've got a few questions already, but everyone just, um, I always took LinkedIn as a way to put your CV out. Um, yeah, LinkedIn is so powerful when it's used right. There's just so many douchebags use it wrong. Um, you know, there's just people that just want to pitch, 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 get nowhere in life. Honestly, like that's not how you build a brand. That's not how you get deals. It's not how you build relationships. You know, don't go into Facebook groups and just be like, hey, look at me. I'm going to add no value. But by the way, this is what I do, X, Y, and Z. Please give me a call. I guarantee you none of those people get phone calls or very few as opposed to people that just go constantly deliver value. And when you deliver value to people, they'll then reach out to you when they're good and ready. But there are quick wins to have in everything that you do do. But the ultimate goal should you know, never, be, never be pitching your business. Um, you always want to just add value to somebody else's business. And from that, you'll get the business. So, uh, questions, uh, question 10, let's go. My eyes are terrible. Um, 
I spoke to the hospital in our area and they said that the NHS do not pay for nurses or doctors accommodation. How is it that you are getting the hospitals to pay for service accommodation? So the hospitals or the uh, nurses that are getting shipped, they'll get a certain amount of pay. So they'll, 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 they'll whilst the money doesn't come direct from the hospitals, it, the hospitals will pay them to come and work short term. So they might get an increase in a, like an overtime allowance. And then from that, they then have to pay for their accommodation. But the hospitals know roughly what it costs to, to house these people. Most of them work on £35 a night per person. That's a good barometer for any sort of contractor type work or any NHS type work is about £35 a night. And that does, it, it, as far as I've seen, the location of that doesn't really change. It goes up slightly as you go down south, but not by much. Um, so it's actually the, the staff that are paying it, but the NH, the, 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 if they want to hire their services, they've got a factor in accommodation. Um, if you take a longer term booking, do you offer weekly, monthly rate or still bill nightly? Now, I think with a longer term booking, when it's direct, this is where you just go into negotiation. So it's just what works for you, what, what sales the deal, what works for us. And, you know, if there's to and fro, and, you know, we, I've had, oh, we need 200 quid a night for a five bed house for, uh, sorry, 200 quid a week for a five bed house for the next three months. Well, that ain't going to work for me, you know? So you either need to take a, a lesser property, size property, or you need to be a budget, you know? So you've got to make sure it works for you always. But at the same time, it's got to work for them. What you do need to factor in, and I quite often do this, so I'll, if they want a lower rate, I'll trade out a couple of changes. So every 10 days, I'll look to do a, a, a linen and a clean. I like to do a clean because I like to keep an eye on the property. So I have had an experience of a cannabis farm, not in a service accommodation, I might add. But the last thing I want is someone, you know, fleecing you saying oh we need it three months we don't need any clean and da 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 and then you walk into a cannabis farm so i like to have eyes on it and i think that's worth paying for the cleaners to go in and just make sure that you know if it's a total wreck that you then get on the company and you say by the way this property is not in good order uh, we'll be coming back next week to check it i need you to improve the condition of it or we'll be terminating the contract and if they're a reputable company they will sort that out they'll have a word with the staff and they'll make sure that it's sorted so you might want to you might trade out a couple of days clean. So you might move from a 10 days clean to every 14 or 16 days and say, okay, well, I'll have that price, but I can only clean every 16 days. And then ultimately you're saving a bit of money on that front. So, uh, so then you can obviously accept the low button. When you join Facebook groups, should you join as your own company or as an individual? I personally think you get more from Facebook as an individual on your own personal profiles. And if you dive into the seven figure property empire group, and you go to the unit section and have a look at uh, day number one of the five-day challenge, you will see how to set your, your, your profile up to make it so it, it is business. And if anyone's on your profile, they'll then know how to interact with you. They'll know what you do. And, um, you know, just look at my profile, look at the banners. You'll pretty much know exactly what happens, uh, what I do as, as a business. Um, so you can engage as your profile, but it's reflective of your business. And that's how Facebook should be set up or any social media for that, for that matter, or business media as it should be called. Uh, you mentioned no keyness, so are all yours essays, electronic entries? No, uh, we just go for the good old fashioned 17 pound lock box, uh, drill it on a wall, stick the keys in it, use the code. They break. But so do the electronic ones. We do have a property with an electronic one on. That broke. Human error. Uh, I think the cleaners somehow managed to change the code and no one really knew what to do. And Anyway, you know, so things are always going to break. But in my experience, people think far too much into the security of these things. You'll spend £125 on a, a fancy doodah lockbox. You can get one for 17 quid that drills into a wall and will last uh, the majority of the time. So I just use those and I've had one nicked in the whole time I've been doing this. Uh, we've probably had three to four where the lock boxes have seized or someone's managed to change the code and the keys are stuck. So, um, but we have, you know, backup plans for that. But the amount of guests that we've had through properties, the amount of properties we've got, that is a very low percentage. And even the one that got nicked, 
we just got the locks changed on the door, which was, you know, 75 quid or whatever. So it wasn't the end of the world. Um, they might not come back, but, you know, we just, we just changed them anyway. Um, do, do, do. Don't have any more questions. How do you catch up with guests that have stayed with you? Is it email, phone, or a system? Um, so I have a system in place whereby we, we touch the guest before, during, and after. And I think you should always be contacting people uh, over th by three methods of communication at all times. So if we send them an email, we'll ring them and say, hey, have you got my email? You know, if you send them uh, a text message, you'll ring them and say, hey, did you get my text? You know, always be just trying to get in touch with people and speaking to people. You know, you send an email to people, you'll get... I, we have a um, an email drip series, which is kind of once a week, an email goes out to our whole guest database. And again, it's not pitching stuff. It's just what's going on, you know, uh, how people can maybe... The best email I've ever sent was a... I did an email about how booking direct saves you money versus going to Airbnb. And I broke down how all the commissions worked. I know the commission structure on Airbnb is changing or has changed already if you've already signed over. But back then, the, the, uh, the guests got hit quite hard. And I think it was about 14%. So I explained how booking direct, they could pay less. And we got, I think it was about six, six and a half grand booking from one email sent out. There was no pitch on it. It was just, they were just like, they were just like, this is a great email. We're in the area next week. How do we book? I've got however many lads staying and I need it for the next few months. So, you know, it turned into quite a nice book in that. So an email drip series is basically just keeping yourself in their forefront, you know, keeping yourself in their peripheral vision that when they do want to book, they know, oh yeah, okay, Luke Holmes will be an email me about service accommodation in that area. So I'll go and have a look at that. Um, you know, where's that email? I'll dig that email back out. And then they make an inquiry. Then we, but nine times out of 10, try and get on the phone, dig into the, um, why are you here? How long are you here for? Who are you working with? When you're here next? Uh, the, 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 the hospital we spoke to said nurses and doctors come in from abroad. The hospital will provide accommodation for the first three months at £300 per month. 300 quid a month inclusive of bills after that nurses will get a house together because they don't have much money the junior doctors get a flat together but won't too much they'll all have to pay for that yeah no they, they do have to pay for their own pockets but um there's always this we're not in this for for long term the nhs stuff's just short term 30 days here 45 days you know they're just either transitioning between hospitals and as you say they get a bit of they get a bit of pocket money to play with, but ultimately they've got to stay somewhere. Uh, but they do get a bit of help with, with, with the payments. Um, as far as I'm aware. Anyway. Uh, when approaching letting agents for more rent to rent, what is your general pitch? Do you say you're looking to house contractors? Uh, work closely with... Um, in brief... I do work with contractors, so that is my pitch. And, um, you know, that's, that's how I get. I think, again, there's probably a whole different training session on how to, you know, penetrate rent to rent through estate agents. Um, but, you know, this, this kind of trends more focused on direct bookings. But, yeah, I mean, contra I do work with contractors. So when we're speaking with people, that is who are staying in the properties, and that's what I talk to them about. So, um, you know, so, so yeah, but... You know, you, you're always telling them that you're advertising on the OTAs, um, and you know, and be transparent. I think you know you build a business on honesty, not on lies and deceit. So, you know, if you if you get your value proposition across, and they believe in what you're doing, and they can see you're passionate about it, and if and even better if you've got a bit of credibility, then you should have no problem, you know, getting through estate agents or enough estate agents to get your deals on or getting direct to landlords which is you know the, the better way to do it in my eyes do you have templates on how to interact with contractors or estate agents to build good relationships they certainly do and they are inside the um program so if you'd like to talk about that afterwards just flash me a dm and then we can discuss um the 90 day program uh, to help you but yeah we have a full full blue Templates on how to 
send the right emails to estate agents to get quick wins, how to speak to people, what language you should be using, what your value proposition is. And that for me is one of the biggest things that most people get wrong when they're starting out on the rent to rent journey. And that's why they get, well, basically told to piss off more times than they get told to, to come in and have a chat and let's take this further. So it's all about the language that you use and um, you know, you change your language, you'll change your results. So hope that helps. Um, any more questions? My property's on a parking. What would you recommend? Should I buy a space in a parking lot? I do think parking is a big thing for certain. It depends on the location. So, and it depends on your avatar that you're trying to attract. If you're trying to attract contractors, I think you need parking or you need a parking permit in a NCP or whatever, very, very close to the property. So we took on 20 properties down in Crawley and the guests had to travel six miles to a key nest to get the keys. And they wondered why they had no bookings. You know, so they, that, that was the, the, the first thing when they said to me, they've got to go to Keyness, I was like, no worries. We'll absolutely smash them out of the park. You know, just by fixing that one thing, we, you know, we just drove revenue in that, into that unit. Um, now, who wants to travel six miles to get a key and then go and hand it back the next day? It's all oh, two days later. You know, they want to be able to just come, ease, check in, check out. So um, it's, it, it's, um, yeah, yeah. For me, parking it's it's not essential. I, we do have places where they don't have parking. We've got permits, um, or like on street parking, fine. But um, city centre stuff with no parking typically lends itself to travelling. Not not contractors. Not, contractors don't want to stay in cities. In my eyes, they want to stay out of cities. Um, but you will get, you know tourists you know we've got places like on the quayside um on like dean street uh, you know gray street places like that where there is no parking and but they absolutely kill it when covid's not here you know because every weekend they're packed they're in the busy they're in the city center but that's what they're designed for and that's why they were acquired that's how i analyzed them as a deal I didn't analyze them for the contractor market and then start scratching my head when I didn't get any contractors through. So you've also got to analyze each unit in its own location on its own merit. I was quite happy not to have that because the train station's three minutes walk up the road. Most people will arrive either by train or from taxi from the airport and then they want to stay in the city center and that's why they book that place. So you've got to kind of analyze your area for, you've got to analyze the property based on the avatar that you want to attract to it. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, how do you find your essays? What's the main things you focus on? Um, viewing numbers. A number of conversations open per week and the number of viewings attended. There's no magic formula for finding these things apart from just hard work and speaking to the right people in volume. You speak to enough people in volume, you open enough conversations you'll find enough units. You know, I, I, you could probably log on to, if I logged on to Newcastle now, I bet there's 3,000 properties for rent. So there's 16 of us on here. Say everyone wanted 10 properties each next year. That's only 160 properties out of the 3,000. That's currently up for rent. So when people say to me, there's not enough properties to rent, you know, it's just, that is nothing more than an excuse. So, you know, it's all about activity levels. So get out there, do the number of viewings that you need to do per week. For contractors, what is the most popular? This is a good question, this. Um, I think at the minute, four, five, and six beds. Maybe definitely fours and fives. Um, the larger properties at the minute are really good. Uh, but then at the same time, you know, your, t your two and three bedders work just as well. Um, the, the bigger companies book the bigger properties and they've got bigger wallets. And they don't, they're not that bothered about moving them around. They just want to lock them into the accommodation for however many months they're there. Um, they're, you know, they, they pay deposits. They're quite, you know, willing to, you know, sort any damage and they're quite easy to work with. The little, let's say, um, you know, the, you, 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 I don't know, a plumbing specialist that comes down from two, three hours away, 
this, the, the owner of the business works in the business and he's got his two lads and they all come in a van, you know, they're, they're more than likely want to sleep in the, in the, in the two bed house and save as much money as they possibly can. So there's, there's no right and wrong answer on that. Uh, I personally try and go for three beds or more. So anything less than two beds, I, I, I really, I probably analyze them more than I analyze the three, four, and five. But I'm not saying I don't take them on because I do. I, t- I tend to take, I'll take on any deal that works. The one beds, I've got plenty of one beds as well. But the, um, for me, if I could choose, it would be three or four bed. You know, if I, if I had a pick of a property of each size, I would choose the three and the four bed property. Um, but every property makes money as long as you rent it right or you purchase it right. You know, how we, the, the, you know, there's there's obviously a um, a well known deal source of getting a bit of stick at the minute, and rightly so because he's shafting people left, right, and centre. But the reason, and and we keep taking over their properties on the management side of things, and the reason the investors are struggling to make money is because they've overpaid on the rent. It's not because the bookings aren't there, or you know that the 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 gross revenue is not enough. It's because they've paid too much rent in the first place. They've overpaid the market value rent. So they're never going to make any money, you know. You've got to make sure you acquire anything, you know. It's it's. You know, someone once sent me. I can't remember who it was, but the money is not in the end. It, the money is how you wait when you buy it. The money, you know, if you whatever you buy and if you bought toothbrushes to sell, you make the money when you buy the toothbrushes, not when you sell them. It's the same with property. You know, you make the money when you buy it, when you acquire it, when you rent it, when you lease it not when you drive your bookings through it. Obviously, that helps. And the more of this sort of stuff that you do, the more profit you'll make. But, you know, you could quite easily make a healthy return on a one and a two-bed flat by driving 1,500 quid a month, four and a half grand into some of the five and six-bed properties. Because, you know, you could get the, the small properties at a much cheaper rent. The running costs are a lot less. So it's all about how you acquire the properties as to how much money you make in the end. Um, you say £35 night for contractors. This will make you around 1050 a month after renting bills and cleaning. Per person per night. Yeah. So, but then at the same time, that might not ring true for, let's say, if... If I had a three-bed house, say if I've got a three-bed flat and they want it, I'm not going to pay, what would that be? Um, let's just round it off to 30 quid a night, so 6, 12, 8, and 20. They're not going to pay size for like 125 or, or 150. It depend, especially if it's through the week. So, But typically, that's where their kind of head is, but then they will look for economies of scale the more people that there are. Um, so, but you've just got to kind of do, do the deals with them. So, you know, you might say, well, a thousand and fifty doesn't work for me, but if you give us two grand and I only clean it once throughout the month, then that's going to work for me and I'll make five, 600 quid profit, happy days, move on. You know, so it's, it's just about working with the companies. It's like any sale. It's just. Like you go and buy a property, you know, you haggle, you, you you do what's right for you, what's right for them. You meet somewhere in the middle, and everyone's happy. How can you get the? Um, yeah, so this is part of your negotiation. It's kind of leading off the next question. So, say if they said, "I want, I want, save the property is one hundred twenty five quid a night." I'll say, right, well, that's okay, but my your weekend should be your bonus money. So for us, like, we can make good money on the weekends in the cities we operate in. So I would like to be able to build those weekends out. So I would say to them, do you actually stay somewhere to store your clothes so you don't have to keep checking things backwards and forwards? And most of them will say, uh, or they might work 10 days on, four days off. So you could even do like every other weekend, you can free up a weekend. So what I would say to them is, if you want that £100 a night rather than the 120 a night, I'll do that, but I need the Friday. And-
they have a go, well, yeah, we don't really use them for the weekends. We literally just like store our food in the fridge and don't have to bring it back. So they're quite happy to, to agree on that. But again, it's like unlocking, you've got to open the question up. You've got to ask the question. You've got to unlock, you know, why they're here, how often they're here, what works. So, um, how many get the weekends uh, booked in the week, winter season? Service accommodation is not, it's, it's not a consistent 12 month thing. It's not like a single let where you get 550 a month, every single month for 12 months. Like you've got to kind of wrap your head around your seasons. And I don't look at it per month. I look at the property December the 31st and say, right, how much has that made since January the 1st? I'll have a rough idea of where it's heading based on, you know, the monthly reports, but I want to analyze it on an annual basis. And then I'm not going to make a decision based on a winter month or a COVID month or, you know, we've all had to react quite differently this year. There's been some good, there's been some You know, September was strong as well. And to be fair, we've, we've had, we had a decent month last month as well. But we drive the direct bookings. We probably have 60% direct bookings, you know, every single month. So we're constantly out driving direct bookings. Um, and when you can do that as well, you don't panic with your prices on the OTAs. Right down because you, you're quite consistently booked and you've got bookings coming in. So you can leave your prices at a decent from if if the cheapest price won then whoever puts it at the cheapest would have 100 percent occupancy all the time you know people don't buy on price they buy on value so um in terms of getting weekends booked you just got to go and do you know what i what we're doing reach out talking to people speaking to insurance companies you know hooking up with football clubs you know you just got to be you know, trying to do absolutely everything you can. You know, and just think outside the box a bit more. Uh, I found my contractors don't keep anything apart during the day, mid-stay. Is this normal? Um, I think, well, in, in all fairness, like, I don't put wardrobes in mine. None of my service accommodation units, unless they had wardrobes in when I acquired them. And even if they did, I'll probably take them out so I can put an extra bed in. Um, they do not have wardrobes in. Because the, no one... I just went to Dubai for four days. I didn't even unpack my suitcase. You know, like... Unless you're going for a three-week holiday, and then you might think about it. So, you know, these guys traveling Monday to Thursday, I guarantee you they live out their bags. So, used. Um, so don't be worried if there's not much in the properties. Um, you know, they might take their bags back on the vans with them each day and then just come back. Um, so um, as long as the properties aren't getting trashed, then I want them. <laughs> um, no, I'll tell you what I buy. I put, um, if you go on Amazon and Google um, something like Chrome, uh, Chrome, wall hanger or something and it's basically this little device that pulls out and goes into a, a triangle and then they just hook the clothes on them seven quid saves you a fortune you drill them on the walls stick some no nails and then make sure they stick right against them and they just pull out and then they go back in and they sit nice and flush on the wall chrome so the cleaners put them back in or the cleaners can actually leave them out with a few hangers on and look quite nice as well so um God knows how much that's saved us over the years, but never once had a complaint that we don't put any wardrobes in our properties. And that's another thing as well. Start listening to what your guests are staying. So I used to put all sorts in bean bags. Uh, I went through a phase of not put, put washing machines in them. Still don't. Probably if I, if I bought a property tomorrow for SA, I wouldn't put a washing machine in it. So unless... I got a long contract of booking and they said, have you got a washing machine? And then I'd weigh up the cost of buying a washing machine versus the booking. Because the majority of people aren't going to, you know, they take their clothes home to get washed. They're not here long enough. Uh, I was going to look at the holiday market in the summer and contract us through the lean months. 
if I put a double bed in, then obviously reduce the number of contractors that will stay. Uh, no, I've never. I've, I don't think I've come across a contractor that'll share a bed with another contractor, but they will sleep in twin beds. Um, they will sleep in twins. It's definitely a lot more relaxed now. I know during COVID or just after COVID, it was, uh, well, most of them were single properties per person. Now it's single rooms, but that seems to have relaxed a bit more even further. So they are willing to share now. Um, the whole bed mix thing is, it's probably a science in itself, I would say. But I try and, if I had a three bed house, I'd put two doubles in in a twin in. But that's based on, the location um i might sometimes put you know two sets of twins in in one double you just i i don't bother with zip link beds i think it's more of a faff for the cleaners and the linen um but i don't think there's an exact science to how you should lay your properties out i think you've got again look at your avatar look what you're trying to attract um you know i've got a a one bed flat which is designed for couples you know, I'm not going to put two twin beds in there. You know, I'm putting doubles in there because it's the right, they're the type of people that I want to bring into the property. So rather than think about what the mix should be, first think about who your avatar is, like who are you trying to attract to the property. If it's purely contractors you want in that property, just stick a load of twin beds in it. But then at the same time, you'll also get the contractor that doesn't want to sleep in a single bed. You know, so you, you get the fussy ones. You might get the, you know, the, the boss man wants his double bed. So he wants a property with a double bed and then he's not really bothered about where his employees sleep. They, they go into singles, but you know, the boss man wants a double bed. So if you don't put a double bed in, he then doesn't book that property for all of his squad. So, you know, there's, there's loads of different <laughs> combinations to think of. It's, it's, it's a minefield that, you know, so hopefully that's helped anyway in a certain way, but it is a minefield. Uh, questions flying and cool. Uh, any more questions? No, nope, don't think so. Cool. Um, if anyone isn't on one of my programs and does want to discuss it, just flash me a DM afterwards and show you exactly how to. Um, do everything that you need rather than, you know, this is one tiny little piece of the puzzle. Uh, if you're looking to scale a property portfolio, you know, there's many pieces of the puzzle that you've got to put together. Um, inside the program, we do trainings like this twice a week. So, you know, you can probably see the value that you do get from it. Um, those that take an action and, and further in their education, which is great. And hopefully we'll implement some of the tasks. If you don't, you're in trouble. Um, but no, awesome. Thanks very much. I hope everyone has enjoyed. If you actually do something about it tomorrow morning, you know, don't wait two or three days. Don't wait till next week. Take action on whatever notes you've taken. Start prospecting. Start getting your business out there. Start going to sites. Start driving your own bookings into your business. And from that, everyone, before, have a great Christmas. Laters.